Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. During my discussion with Sybil, a nonprofit professional and founder of Do Your Good, a foundation advisor program helping donors give to the nonprofits they care about the most, which got me thinking about giving. What is giving? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? There are so many ways to give back, shop local and support small businesses, adopt a street, volunteer, financial giving, and many others. I'm going to focus on the last one, financial giving. To break down financial giving, I'm going to make three different giving buckets. These are my own personal buckets and the way I view the financial giver, donor, fundraiser, philanthropist. Let's break these down. By definition, a donation, excluding healthcare donors here, is something that is given to a charity, especially a sum of money. In short, being a donor is given a sum of money to a charity, and this includes the entrepreneur's time. Time is money, but there are other types of donations. A reoccurring gift is one way an entrepreneur make an annual, quarterly, or monthly donation. It simply means there is a reoccurring sum of money being donated to a nonprofit 501c3. Note, a 501c3 charitable organization is able to solicit for public donations. An entrepreneur can donate stock. Simply fill out a stock transfer form from a brokerage on a stock that can be transferred to a charity. Note, the deduction is limited to 30% of the entrepreneur's adjusted gross income. The one-time donation is just that. Maybe the entrepreneur is at a grocery store and they ask to round up to the nearest dollar for the local children's hospital. Saying yes makes the entrepreneur a donor. However, it leads to another form of donation, fundraising. If clerks are inquiring at checkout for a donation, the store is likely fundraising for a specific cause, and an entrepreneur can be a fundraiser too. A fundraiser is a person employed to raise funds as an institution or political cause. GoFundMe has to be one of the best known fundraising platforms. Almost anyone can start a campaign to raise funds for their respected causes. Warning. Don't be a jerk and create a fake cause or raise money for personal gain. Lastly, there is philanthropy. Philanthropy is the desire to promote the welfare of others, expressed especially by the generous donation of money to good causes. Being a philanthropist is a little more in-depth than being a donor. A donor might donate for emotional impulse, the clerk asking to round up for the local children's hospital, for example. But a philanthropist aims at the root cause of social issues by establishing long-term approaches. An endowment is a great example of being a philanthropist and something I hope I can leave one day. An endowment is a nonprofit's investable assets, which are used for operations or programs that are consistent with the wishes of the donor. And there are three types of endowments that I'm not going to get into at this time. However, here is how I want to be a philanthropist through an endowment. I want to leave an endowment fund, a large sum of money in an interest growing account to provide free business education in underserved communities. I am defining underserved communities as those communities with schools with 50% or more of their students on free or reduced lunch. I want the Gabriel Flores Endowment to provide free business education in those communities. And the money in the endowment fund should provide enough funding for self-support for programs for decades. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Being a donor, fundraiser, or philanthropist helps bring meaning to the entrepreneur's life. I always feel much better about my Mountain Dew and Cheetos purchase after rounding up to the nearest dollar at the cash register. And I'm very confident that if I'm able to generate enough wealth, an endowment will help support the mission of the Shades of Entrepreneurship for many years. And that mission is interviewing entrepreneurs to support the future entrepreneur. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Next 
guest has built her company from the ground up under the assumption that it is possible to build a better world by doing it. And she has helped organizations and donors to contribute over $45 million. Please welcome philanthropist, advisor, founder, and president of Do Your Good, Sybil Ackerman Munson. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I have Sybil. How are we doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited because we were actually having this conversation before. This is, folks, this is exactly what entrepreneurship is. This is an individual who had an idea that I had. But this individual actually did something with it. That makes the difference between a person with an idea and a person that becomes an entrepreneur. But, but first, we get before we're getting all that, give us a little background. Tell, introduce the world. Who are you? Well, so I thank you for introducing me too. I'm I'm Sybil, and I started a business called Do Your Good. And the reason I did that is I worked in the nonprofit space for years, and then one of the donors who funded my work asked me to run his foundation. And I said, I would love to, oh my gosh, but I had no idea what I was doing. (laughs) I jumped over there. All of this is in Oregon, by the way. Um, But I jumped over there. I started working for this foundation full time. And then I started getting other donors who found out that I was working in this way, asking my advice. And I realized that there was a real demand out there for People who are donors, people who are philanthropists, people who have some extra money to give away, they want to do it purposefully. And so then I started saying to myself, oh my gosh, it's a little silly for me to be full-time with this one donor and one foundation when I have all these folks asking if they could maybe hire me. And so that's when I became an entrepreneur. And I actually didn't even know that's what I was. (laughs) But once I went over into that world where I started my own business And now I'm an S Corp and I created this other arm of my business, which is Do Your Good, where now I'm creating online courses and supporting both donors and nonprofits and helping to connect them up. And it's so much fun because being an entrepreneur, while it's a little stressful, right, (laughs) because you're all on your own, it's so great to be creative in that space. So um, it was really funny. I started listening to some podcasts from people saying, talking about entrepreneurship and I started realizing that these are my people. I mean, this is really what I want to do. That's me. So, yeah, totally. And I'm here in Oregon. Um, I love Oregon. I've been here since 1993. And, um, yeah, no, I, I look forward to the conversation, talk about what I do. But I'm happy to also talk about just what did it? What does being an entrepreneur mean to me, you know? Yeah. In, in fact, before we get too much, give, give the folks a little background. What exactly does Do Your Good do? Okay. So. It does two things. If you're somebody who wants to give money away to deserving nonprofits and to issues you care about, but you're either, you've either been doing that for a while, giving donations, and fit, you're feeling a little bit disillusioned. You're like, I'm not really that connected to what I'm doing. Or you're just starting out. You're like, I, I'm doing pretty well now in my life, and I want to give back. You know, I don't need to buy a car. I don't need to do these things. I, I want to give that money to good nonprofits, but I don't really know where to start. I feel overwhelmed. That's what Do Your Good is for. It's either help reinvigorate you in your passion for giving, or it's to help give you a guidebook, a guide. I'm a guide to help you give money to to, uh, to nonprofits effectively. And, you know, now by now I've given away help. <laughs> people give away over $45 million in donations, large and small already. And, you know, I get pitched by nonprofits every day. I process almost upwards of 200 proposals a year from nonprofits. And I work with many, many, many families one-on-one. And so that's why I also created this arm of my business, which is like more where I have weekly podcasts. I have free resources. I have all these things because I really want more people to give. I don't want them to get disillusioned or feel overwhelmed. We really need to give to these great nonprofits doing good stuff in the world. The other part of my business is helping nonprofits themselves hone their pitch. Because like I told you, I listen to pitches every single day. And there's some people who just kick it out of the ballpark. They do so well. But then there's so many who don't. 
And I know they're doing good work on the ground, right? But they're just not able to articulate that effectively to donors. And so they keep hitting dead, dead ends. And so I've created some courses and other things through my Do Your Good business to help them and help them out. Oh, I almost lost you there. I think, did you lose audio? No. Oh, uh -uh. perfect. Oh, perfect. So I got to ask you this because I'm looking at your qualification in education. Uh, I'm, I'm, you got a bachelor's in science at Scripps College, right? Uh, and then you went to forestry at Yale. And then from there, you got your JD. How'd you get in a nonprofit? <laughs> I'm just, I'm very, very, very interested to kind of hear that story. How did, how did the nonprofit world, how did you kind of finally get into nonprofit? Yeah, I love that question. So I'm really passionate about environmental work and conservation work. That's really where I'm passionate. And how I got passionate about that is I, one summer, was an intern for the National Park Service. And it was when I was 19 years old. And I always loved animals when I was a kid, right? I wanted to be a veterinarian. Oh, <laughs> but okay. yeah, I just want to be a veterinarian. I'm so interested in that. But then I went out and I was an intern for the Park Service. And I was supposed to watch these little birds called the piping plovers. And they were endangered. They were about to go extinct. And I was supposed to, show, to, I was supposed to find them and then mark off where their nests were. And what happened that summer, though, is that there were so many plovers actually on this one beach that the Park Service had to close it down to off-road vehicles. And there were huge, 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 huge protests. And then everyone had to find a compromise. And they did. They figured out, okay, where should the cars go? Where should the, how should we protect the birds given the fact that there's those needs? And I was so fascinated with this discussion and how, and I was in the middle of it. I was going out going through the protests, it was really actually sort of scary. Um, but it was also just so enlightening for me to see that there's people, there's tension, and then there's a way to work through it yeah. to find a balance. And I was hooked. I went back to college and I actually got my BA from Scripps College, Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies. So I majored in Environmental Studies and I wrote my thesis on the Endangered Species Act and how to find compromise through something called a Habitat Conservation Plan. I was so obsessed. I was like, how can we really work hard on this issue? And then um, I went and got my law degree because, and I never wanted to really be a lawyer, <laughs> but I wanted to understand. I went to Lewis and Clark. That's what brought me to Oregon, Lewis and Clark Law School, because they could do great stuff in environmental law. And I wanted to understand how do these laws get implemented? How do we do this? And so I sat, did that for a long time. And then what I did was I became an activist working for groups like Sierra Club, National Wildlife Federation, Audubon Society, and League of, Oregon League of Conservation Voters, all in Oregon. And I came up here during, you, you might remember this, the Spotted Owl Wars oh, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. the 90s. That's when I came up here. And it was tense. So it was sort of like the piping plover incident, but on steroids. So I was in the middle of all that trying to think through, well, how can we find durable solutions? How can we talk to people who are of all diverse backgrounds to find durable solutions to these problems? I was just, again, hooked. And so I worked, I worked in the field for over eight years. And then after that, that's when I said to myself, I actually, I'm, I've been working so hard. I've been trying so hard on these things. I want to take a year and go back east to Yale and get my master's there to really think even more about what these problems, these big, huge, hairy problems mean for society and how can I, pl how can I play a productive role in them? So for me, that was my journey. Then when I got back, that was when I transitioned into being a philanthropist and working full-time for a donor who had funded me and all the different work that I did before. And um, I started then thinking about, okay, in the funding world, you can really do even more about, you know, try to make, trying to make a difference. And um, in terms of, I shouldn't say more, but you can really make a difference there. And so that's, that's my issue area expertise. And so the donors that I work for, a lot of them know a lot about environmental work or care about environmental work. But I also am getting more and more interested in the mega question of structurally, how do you give money away effectively, no matter what cause you care about? Yeah. And that's what Do Your Good's all about, is I translate, like my, I've been in so many trustee meetings now and all these different things. And I'm like, I have a responsibility now to try to put all this down on paper and help even more people make a difference in the world so that they don't 
you know, we just, we need, we need even more givers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, and for those folks, just a little, a little history lesson, because the Spotted Owl Wars is something I haven't heard in so long. Um, if, if I, as, as I recall it correctly, the, it kind of boiled down to, you know, individuals were fighting for these owls to have their own habitat. But then yeah. the logging company, the timber company, were, were kind of, their fight was, well, we need to cut down these trees because if we don't, then the loggers will lose their jobs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. it was. It, I mean, there's a lot more to it than that, but just got it. That, that that was kind of the gist of it, which is really very, very. If, please, I think there's actually a podcast, so please, if there is, go out there and listen to it. I'm pretty sure it's great. I've not. Yeah, OPB it. did a oh, did a really I, interesting see, I, podcast series recently perfect. on this issue, the exact issue. Mm -hmm. about, I'll I'll make sure I'll hopefully I'll put that on the newsletter, which is perfect time to remind everybody to please subscribe to the newsletter. Now, now <laughs> when was uh, Do Your Good established? Like, when did you actually create it? So, well, I started my business, my, where I was doing one-on-one -on -one client work back in 2012, I think. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I started Do Your Good um, in earnest. I had the idea for a long time, but in earnest during COVID. So, Really in around 2020, I started the Do Your Good side of my business, which was the podcast, which is the podcast, the um, mini courses that I've created, the free resources, and these philanthropy accelerators and all of those pieces. Um, and I, I, I had a little extra time because I wasn't traveling as much. Um, I did get COVID a few times and it was a very stressful time. So I also feel like do, the Do Your Good project was something that helped sort of keep balance in my life a little bit. It was a, a creative outlet for me. So, um, and now it's off to the races. I'm having so much fun with it. Yeah. And I feel like, the, you know, I, admittedly the podcast was similar, you know, to, it was my creative outlet during the pandemic. Yeah. And now it's, you know, yeah. taking a life of its own. Now, back in 2012, what was kind of your true north for Do Good? Why, why was the company created originally? Well, I, I, I really like that question and there's, it's a multifaceted answer. So I hope it's okay yeah, if I no. go there. I mean, the first, the first piece of it is more personal. Um, a couple of years before that, I had gotten divorced. And in part, um, there was a lot of reasons that that, that occurred, of course. It's always, it's always multifaceted there, too. Yep. But, but one of the things I really felt I needed to do was to get in charge of my life and to define what I wanted to do and really get in charge both of my finances, my next steps, my future. And creating my business was that personal empowerment step um, for me. So that's the personal side. Um, on the more like business career side, the reason I did the jump is I, like I said, the first thing was I realized that I wanted to have more control just over my own decisions around like, how much money do I put in retirement? What do I do with X, Y, and Z? all those little nitty gritty decisions around um, next steps that are linked to business, the business world and like how you're doing things. Yep. I wanted to make those decisions. I didn't want to have a company or a nonprofit tell me what their overarching rules and regulations are. And this is what they do. And you have no choice. I wanted to create that for myself. Um, and then I also, honestly, there was a part of it that was a little bit backing into it too, because what I, but at the same time I was pretty strategic. So I had a lot of different folks saying, Sybil, we want to, it was just sort of a fun time in my life. People were saying, Sybil, we want to hire you for this and this and this. But I really loved working as a philanthropist and I loved working for the family that I was working for, Lazar Foundation. They are were terrific to me and really good to me. And so I didn't want to leave them. And so what happened was a lot of the other folks who wanted me to work for them, they sort of thought up this idea too. They said, well, and I did too. Why can't I do some contracting for you on the side is how it started. Mm -hmm. And then, then that evolved into once people started finding out that I did contract work, even more and more potential work. And so then what happened was I went back to my first family at Lazar and I said, hey, you know, I've got all these folks asking of me to work for them. Um, can I create my own business? And then can I still work for you? But you'll be a client in my business. And so they said yes to that. They still are my client. Um, um, but, and they still are my, some of my, they really support the work that, that I've been doing through my business for a long time. Um, so I still manage their dockets and help them figure out where they want to fund and all that kind of thing. Nice. You know, yeah. you, you mentioned like in the start of this, one of the things you, you really wanted to do was take charge, right? You take yeah. charge financially, yeah. 
um, take charge. You didn't want a nonprofit or any of those things kind of telling you what to do. How did you do that? How did you create this company financially? Because did you grassroot it to kind of ensure that you have total control? Well, the, the, I mean, the, one of the main things I had was an anchor client. So I had Lazar Foundation as my anchor client. So essentially, you know, they were happy because they could pay me a little less um, than if I was a, when I was a full-time employee. But I was happy because I put a price on the amount per month that they paid me that would pay for my mortgage, pay for my base food, you know. So if I didn't have anybody else signing up for my work, I knew that I could at least pay for my fundamentals. When I have people coming to me and ask ask me about, you know, how did how do you do it, Sybil? And they're they're sort of thinking about whether they want to do it. I um I suggest to them that they try to think through proactively before they go out on their own um, and take that big step of having their own business. Are there a few key anchor organizations or clients that they really enjoy and really like that they can see those those folks being with them for two to three to four years? That, that's like, that's such a great step. So for me, that's, that was my, uh, my step. Uh, I've seen too many times friends and colleagues who decided they wanted to make the jump into the entrepreneurial world and really not have that. And it's been very stressful for them. And they end up just having to run, run from the next one to the client, to the next client, to the next client. And then it just, it's just tough. So you lose focus then and you lose passion for what you're doing. Um, so yeah, no, I didn't actually don't, I, I didn't grassroots it. I was super, super lucky that I had that core client that was flexible, understood. And then um, once I jumped, things did happen in a good way, you know, but every year I have to tell you, I, I don't, I don't have a big ego at all. I'm like very humble. And so every single year I'm like, are my clients going to keep me? I don't know. I don't know. And I'm still <laughs> running scared. I still run scared. My husband laughs. I have a, I have a husband now, a second husband who I'm really in love with. And he is like, he's always laughing at me every year. Cause he's like, Sybil, don't worry. Don't worry. Take a breath, you know, but still, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you just have to stress about that stuff. <laughs> always. If you're not stressing and you're an entrepreneur, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know, the other thing, I don't have vacations really. I don't have any of that stuff, but at the same time, I always feel like I'm always working and always playing. Right. Cause I'm, I'm picking the things I want to do. That's true. And I, and anytime I, I get maybe tired or stressed, I'm like, look, Sybil, I have a talk with myself. I'm like, I chose to do this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no one else is making me do this. Right. So <laughs> now is, is do your good. Are you, can, are you for profit or a nonprofit business? I'm a for profit. Okay. Yeah. I'm a for-profit, full-on business, S-Corp. Yeah. Now, what would you say has been easy about starting your S-Corp? The easy part of starting my S-Corp is, um, well, first I started as just a general LLC. Um, and then- Yeah, tell, tell the, the guests kind of why you decided to go from an LLC to an S-Corp. Yeah, so um, I was a general LLC, and then I decided to go the S-Corp for a couple of reasons. First, you know, I I- I definitely make sure that I get advice from folks who know more than I do about particular yes. areas. So yep. I really lean on my tax people, yep. my tax person who's been wonderful. And essentially what happened was I was just a general LLC and then I started making more money. And um, when when I started making more money and getting more successful, and I don't make a ton of money, but you know, better money than before, mm -hmm. the folks were saying, you know, Sybil, what you really should do with it is create an S Corp because then you can decide how much you pay yourself. So I ha I'm an employer and an employee, yep. right? Yep. So I can decide how much I pay myself based on like what a person would earn on with the kind of stuff that I do. And then you, I also then have even more control over like, how do I manage my retirement? Um, <clears throat> It helped me really think through, um, you know, how I do disbursements. My I also contract a lot of folks, and I'm been debating whether I hire someone now. That's the whole next step, nice. you know. Um, now that my business is getting a little little better, I you know I'm thinking about that. It's a little scary though, because then I'm helping, I'm I'm supporting another person, ah, you know. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> so I really really love that I made that decision to go to be an escort because. It gives me so much more flexibility to think through, you know, what, what should I do with disbursements? Um, where, where do I expense key pieces of my business? Um, I am contracting quite a few people who are helping me at all different levels in the areas of things I don't know, but I want to keep expanding on. 
there's just a lot of really interesting creative things you can do as an S corp that you really can't if you're just a straight up um, sole proprietor LLC. Yeah, and what what have you know you weren't in an entrepreneur previously. You, you mentioned you were no. kind of working. What has been hard about kind of going through the going from corporate world to entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, and I actually was always in the nonprofit sector, but that's nonprofit corporate, right? Yeah. There's, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so let me tell you. Let me tell you. There's a bunch of different things, but one of the things that I was that was that I didn't know that I was uh, getting into when I became a consultant and entrepreneur is whereas before when I'd work at a nonprofit or when I worked as the executive director at that foundation, the people who I was working for, you know, every year during my performance evaluation, they would be like, okay, Sybil, we're going to give you a raise. How can we keep you? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, When I became a consultant, the opposite started happening. People would say, Sybil, you're doing so well and you're so successful. So we think we should pay you less. And there would be this weird And it was even some people who like, you know, I had maybe been employed by them before, you know, in general, like it it was weird, the transition, the transition. And then, and so, and it's sort of like that, that I didn't expect at all. Um, So I had to learn how to actually get a little bit of an ego and be like, this is what I'm worth and you need to pay me for that. And if you don't, I will walk away. Um, and I needed to do it even more strongly as a consultant than when I was employed by the organization. And so that was something that was hard and I wasn't ready for. Now I, it's easier. It's been 10 years, you know, or over 10 years now. So um, it's much easier for me to just say, okay, this is what I'm worth. <laughs> you have to pay me for that. And uh, if you don't, then fine. Although I have to tell you that I still struggle with it. <laughs> um, so that's a hard piece. Another yeah. hard, Another hard piece is I do work a lot. Right. And I um, in my relationship, I have this I have a wonderful relationship with my husband. He has a job that is a job job. It's not a he's not an entrepreneur and he's not a consultant and he has vacation and he has a lot of balance in his life. And yeah. for me as an entrepreneur, I'm I don't have that right as 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 easily. It's not easy as easy to find. Right. So I can't I don't have paid vacation. I don't have all those pieces. And so navigating and I don't personally care about that like I can figure out how to take time off but but trying to navigate that and keep a healthy strong relationship is something that I need to be sure I'm always reminding myself about and luckily I have a a, a partner who is understanding but um he definitely will push back and be like hey you know you're working <laughs> again this weekend <laughs> man always you know you mentioned you this is something you've new there's some difficulties you 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 uh, certainly have some concerns, right? Bringing on a new employee. Hey, can they make sure we bring them on and I got to care for them? What, what keeps you going? I mean, this is a lot of work. So what motivates you to continue? The work keeps me going. I love what I'm doing. Oh my gosh. I love it so much. I, the, my clients are wonderful, caring people who all they want to do is good in the world. This is on my one-on-one client side, right? So I have do your good, which is the sort of creating the mini courses, but the, the one-on-one clients I have, they're amazing. They just want to do good in the world. And they're like, Sybil, we have wealth and we want you to help us and help and connect us with nonprofits. And and then I talk to nonprofits every day who are doing amazing, amazing work and they're passionate and their eyes are sparkling. And they're like, here's how we're doing this and that. And they're on the ground and they're just trying to get it done. Right. Um, I just got back from an amazing conference that I was at um, in California with a bunch of other philanthropists working on ocean issues, for example. So inspiring. I learned so much at that conference and I can't wait to, t- to talk to my trustee, the one of my clients who, who funded me to go there. And I just constantly pinched myself. <laughs> I'm like, I created this thing. I created this thing based on the stuff that I love to do, you know, and I sort of pulled it together and it's working. And so every day I'm doing what I want to do. You know, next week I go to the coast and I'm meeting with, I'm doing site visits with a bunch of funders and a bunch of, and we're meeting with bunch of the wonderful uh, nonprofits that we've been funding for, gosh, probably over five years. And we're going to go out and, you know, now that COVID is still, it's still there, but it's, we can travel again. Yep. It's the first time I've seen some of these folks in like three years in person. So this is the kind of thing that keeps me going. I just love what I do. You know, I just love it. So I that love makes it. it worthwhile. I like 
Yeah. Now let's flip it around. What what are yeah. what's something that like what is the one thing you think about pretty consistently? What is the one thing you think about the most? Maybe it keeps you up at night. What is that one thing? Maybe there's multiple Oh things. gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Um th- there's multiple things probably. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess the biggest thing that keeps me up at night is there's all of this good in the world, but is it going to be enough? That's on the one side of it. And then the next side of it is, you know, I'm getting older, not getting any younger. Am I doing enough myself? Mm. And that comes out in lots of ways in the middle of the night, because I'll be trying to think through a big problem. Um, Climate change is something that I worry about a lot. I mean, we, I have uh, my own son and then three step kids. I love them all dearly. And, you know, what world are we leaving them? I know that might even sound a little corny because so many people say that (laughs) nowadays, but still I worry about that. And so um, I guess my challenge is, and also one of the, I guess it could be called a strength, but my challenge is, is like, I have so much passion. I want to get so much done and there's only limited time and we have so many big problems to overcome. Yeah. And, you know, for the folks that are listening that feel like your philanthropy dollars don't make it, um, trust me, they do. I, I'll give you some great yeah, examples of, of money and making a difference. I yeah. want you to look at breast cancer survival rates the last 10 years. Go look at survival rates the last 10 years, and then I want to tell you exactly why they're that way. Research and education. Now, now we know about screenings. We know about how to prevent it. We know how to catch it early. We know how to detect it with early detection. We now know how to treat it with early treatment. We know how to survive from it. Okay. Same thing with lung cancer, same thing with skin cancer. In fact, if we can catch skin, skin cancer is the only cancer you should never die from. It's the only cancer you can see with your eyes. And if you catch it early enough, no one should ever die from skin cancer. Right. And that's, that's all about this philanthropist dollars. But even further than that, there's actually been a lot of people on this show right that that have you know fox boxes look at what fox box is doing for a lot of these pediatric children making sure that they feel comfortable in these hospitals you got fighting pretty making sure these individuals that are fighting cancer feel feel you know cared for and about there's just a lot of these different programs and i think you know not only as individuals but even even as entrepreneurs that that maybe at one day get to that point where we do have an excess of money and we are able to create some type of uh, program just know that these dollars do make it down to individuals in need. Uh, and it's, it's really nice to see uh, that, you know, we have somebody like Sybil that's really kind of helping people determine what their true north is. Because that's really what Do Your Good's trying to help you do is determine what is my true north? Where do I want to support it? And it, it might not, it may not be for to be dollars. You might want to just support your volunteer, your time. You know, that's exactly. also a donation, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I always love saying this. And I'm going to say it to you today. No matter what you're interested in, there's a do good thing connected to it. Yep. No matter what you are interested in. And that's the thing you should invest in because that's the thing you know about. And so you you name it, anything. You like to run. You like, you really engage in your kid's school. Anything. Right. You can find a do good group that then you can invest in. But the question is, how do you do it so that you're not wasting your money and you're not wasting the nonprofit's time and money? And that also is similar if you're volunteering your time too. You want to be sure that you're volunteering in a way that that is really productive. Yep. And that's the kind of thing that I just happen to have a lot of expertise in. And so that's why I wanted to create my business is to really help people, connect nonprofits to really great people who have wealth and help people move forward to make the world a better place. (laughs) I might be idealistic, but I see it happening. I see it happening. So it makes me a very happy person. (laughs) It's going to take a village. Definitely. Yeah. Now, Sybil, what, what, what's some advice you have for some of the listeners? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's lots of different things. Um, But the first thing I want to talk about is in, if you are somebody, let's, let me talk to you. If you're somebody who has wealth and wants to give it to worthy causes, and then I'll talk to you if you're, working in a nonprofit, you're interested in thinking about how to fundraise even more effectively. How about that? Want to do both sides? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So if you're a donor or if you're somebody with wealth and you want to give money away, the first thing I want to talk to you about is assuming you've figured out the issue you want to spend your 
um, time and money on. So maybe you already figured that out. You're like, oh, I absolutely know. It's it's um, children's health or it's climate change. I are, I'm, Sybil, I totally know that. Okay, so let's say you figured that out. There's still another level of things you have to think through before you give your money away. What I've seen in my career working with donors is that there are three types of donors. And you need to do some work to figure out your donor type before you start giving money away. There are sustainer donors, there's campaigner donors, and there's launcher donors. A sustainer donor is somebody who wants to give money to a nonprofit year after year. They're really busy. You're, you're, you might be somebody who's really busy. You, you know you care about the issue, but you really don't have that much time to devote to it. But you want to support those nonprofits. So that means you're a sustainer donor. Gotcha. So you'll just give year after year. You won't meddle in the, in the organization's affairs too much, and you'll just give year after year general support. But if you're somebody who is really, really worried about a major societal issue, let's say it's climate change or houselessness or you name it, and you feel like there's major hurdles to get to success, then that's what, what you are is a campaigner kind of donor. Because it means you want to move the needle on an issue. It means that you're not going to be that happy just giving year after year general support donations. You're going to want to fund a bunch of groups that are like ending houselessness or seriously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's where you're going to be excited. And if you're not clear with yourself that that's the kind of donor you are and you just start going out into the world and, and start giving money, you're going to get disillusioned really fast. So I have some tips and tricks to figure out and little quizzes to help you figure out what kind of donor you are there if you're a campaigner. Nice. Now, a launcher donor fills a gap. Sorry about that. No, you were going to say something. No, I was going to say, can, in fact, okay. can, that, that information that you just mentioned, is this something they can find, in fact, on your yes. website? Perfect. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I have a little free uh, video that you can click on uh, that talks a little bit about the different types. So um, definitely you can you can check it out there. And then a launcher donor, if you are somebody who likes to, you're sort of like a venture capitalist, you know, like that kind of person. You love to come in early and start new things and fill gaps. So let's say like, for example, I'll use climate change as an example. Like you care about climate change. You see a ton of people doing a lot of stuff. But what you also see is that like all the groups are doing their own research on science or something, and they're not sharing their research. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is a big gap that needs to be filled. So you work with a bunch of other people and a nonprofit and you fund like a startup of a science sharing institute or something. And that doesn't necessarily take a ton of money on your end because then you could partner with other folks and it's really exciting and you help them out for three years. And then once they're established and they're getting sustainer donors <laughs> who are funding them year after year, you then go on to the different, a different project that's filling a gap. So that's what I let really try to hone in with you on too, is you might know what you want to fund, but let's also think about the donor type you are. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the nonprofit side, what I do is I talk to nonprofits a lot about, first of all, how do you as a nonprofit person talk to a donor at like they're a human being and not a bank transaction? Because all too often I get pitched by folks who are just like, okay, here's our laundry list, you know, and it does not work. <laughs> I want to give money away. I want to support them. And it makes it really tough. And so what I try to do in my little mini courses and other things to support nonprofits is I help them try to suss out, first of all, what kind of donor are they talking to? Are they talking to a sustainer kind of donor or a campaigner kind of donor or a launcher kind of donor? That's good to know because it really matters in terms of how you do your pitch. If you're talking to a sustainer donor, you talk generally about your organization, you invite them to your cool outings, your volunteer activities, your annual you know, fundraiser, you do all that and they'll be really happy and they'll want to do that as long as you're connecting to their passion in general. But if you're talking to somebody who's a campaigner donor, you are going to lose them at hello if you just start giving them brochures about your general information. Instead, you're going to need to find out, okay, what's the major societal issue you're trying to change? Because you might not, you might be only working on that as part of your programs. And then you, you pitch to them an actual project where you're trying to change the norm on whatever it is you're working on. So those are the kind of things that I talk about for nonprofits to help them out. Nice. That's, man, I feel like 
there's, it's kind of funny. You just think about the nonprofit world and you're kind of just thinking about, oh, I just give money away and you're good. But you're kind <laughs> of breaking it down into like, no, we're, there's, there's kind of different segments of this. Yeah, totally. I mean, this is a real profession, figuring out how to give money away and how to support nonprofits. It's a real profession. You know, it's yeah. a, it takes expertise. It takes knowledge. Um, and what I'm hoping to do with both, I do the one-on-one -on -one work. So I help people with my profession and know how to do it. But then I'm also trying to sort of crowdsource it a little bit with this do your good part where I have these online courses and other things so that people can also you know, on their, in their own time, they can learn the general ideas so they can get themselves ready and knowledgeable. So they don't necessarily always have to hire someone like me one-on-one -on -one, and they can do the job well and not leave money on the table and be passionate about their work. Now for folks that want to maybe find more information about this, where can, where do they find you? Where are you at online? Where yeah, are you in yeah. the social world? Where can they find you? Yeah, totally. Totally. So I have a weekly podcast where I interview people, donors and nonprofits about uh, about their giving strategies. And so it's really fun. So you can go on any um, podcast site and type in do your good or my name, Sybil Ackerman Munson, and you should be able to find me. And then on Instagram and Facebook, I'm at the little at sign, do your good. And then um, you can also find me on the web at www.doyourgood.com. That's where everything is. Like I've got all my podcasts and all the different things and the free resources and then the thing that I have on offer right now, of two things. If you're a donor, well, I always have these mini courses that you can get. They're on Evergreen. Like you can get them anytime for both nonprofits and donors. But the things I'm creating now that are new, for if you're a donor, I'm doing these special three-month long philanthropy accelerators. And they're I'm purposely going to have them where you have, there's no more than 10 donors that are going to be in this mastermind. And the philanthropy accelerators are geared towards trying to unpack key questions that you as a donor can have and helping you figure through those. And they're geared towards busy professionals. So the first philanthropy accelerator that I'm creating is really to help people demystify a nonprofit's financials and to be able to help them in articulating to the nonprofits what they actually want to see in a financial in, fi in, their, in the financials of the nonprofit. And I'm really excited to offer that. So I, if anyone's interested, I have that up on my website, a little link so that you can get on the wait list for that. And then on the nonprofit side, the thing I'm creating and offering really, really soon, we're about to put the link up on my website, is if you're a nonprofit person, in addition to my little mini courses that are already up there, I'm creating this special limited edition email sequence. It's a six month email sequence where if you sign up for this, you will get in your inbox every single week, a special tip to hone your fundraising pitch. And also there'll be a special exclusive link in that email. So you can ask me special questions if you have anything that's really burning on your mind. And, um, and I can try to answer them as well for you. So those are the two things I have on offer right now. <laughs> Perfect. Sybil, thank you so much. That was, again, folks, a lot of information, I know. But however, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. No, no, a lot of great, <laughs> great, great information. Please subscribe to the newsletter because I will have a lot of this information on the newsletter. We'll also have the information about the website. So how you can contact with Sybil, how we can actually go ahead and if you're interested in learning more, because I, I find this personally myself, I find it quite fascinating because I work with donors quite often. So again, Great. folks, uh, Sybil, thank you again so much for joining me on the show today. I really, really do appreciate it. A lot of cool information, a lot of cool what you're doing. Again, an idea I thought I had and you actually put it into a business model. So I'm really excited for you. Uh, for our folks at home, please subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com. You can also follow me at the Shades of E on all the social sites. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.